What I want to talk about today is uh, what's even more than important than uh, those sort of market forces. Uh, what, uh, uh, as both France and Britain, we face in common and how that may affect us over the next few years. Now in particular that Napoleon's prediction has come true that uh, China has woken up and is shaking to the, the world to the benefit, of course, among others, of Bordeaux, since the Chinese are now the biggest importers of claret uh, around the globe. They've also, I just notice, in parenthesis, have started to play cricket. <laughs> <laughs> I want to talk um, about that uh, new world, the new economic order, and the implications that it has for two medium-sized uh, European countries which have uh, shared quite a lot of pretty distinguished history um, but are now uh, bound to discover uh, working in common um, how little really separates them. What's happened? Let me describe it slightly autobiographically. I first visited uh, the United States in 1965 when I was a student. And I looked up the figures the other day. In 1965, uh, America represented 38% of the world's <coughs> income, with 5% of the world's population. Um, even though that figure changed during the subsequent decades of the last century, America became ever more dominant politically as the century wore on. Memorably described by Hubert Védrine, whom I much admired, French foreign minister of course, as a country which was not just a superpower but hyper power. I suppose the height of the dominance came after the fall of the Berlin Wall, when Francis Fukuyama, the uh, American political scientist, wrote a book called The End of History, by which he didn't literally mean the end of interesting times, but meant the triumph of political and economic liberalism, represented uh, economically by the Washington Consensus uh, and uh, represented politically by what seemed to be America's ability to do anything it wanted wherever it wanted to do it. Several things happened to change that world. First of all, it's extremely difficult to be a superpower if you're the world's biggest debtor. And America, for some years, was the world's um, uh, borrower of last resort. Domestic borrowings in the United States increased from about 750 million billion uh, in the mid-1970s to 14 trillion by the time of the um, crash in 2008. America also discovered um, in uh, Afghanistan and Iraq that its huge technological um, advantages militarily were not enough for it simply to be able to get its own way. And both treasury and blood, much of it American, more of it Iraqi, and some of it British, drained away into what Winston Churchill described as the thankless deserts of Mesopotamia. But there was something else happening at the same time, uh, which again I remark um, partly through uh, uh, autobiographical spectacles. I was Britain's development minister in the 1980s when we used to talk about the third world. What we meant were those countries, principally though not exclusively, um, ex-colonies of European countries. We meant those countries uh, which rejected 
the Western model. They might have an election, but usually only once. Uh, they turned their back on capitalism. Uh, they became associated with, in our minds with the manufacture of what? Polyester. Cheap plastic, polyester. Cheap plastic toys. Uh, Soviet-era tractors. And uh, corruption. And they set out to create a new international economic order by uh, forming cartels of commodity producers to take on the rich countries of the world and drive a better bargain with them. Well, eventually, they got a new international economic order. They got a new international economic order by making their peace with capitalism. And one after another found that the best way of becoming prosperous was by making, at a cheaper price, the goods which rich countries wanted to buy. In 1992, the emerging markets, as they had become known, the emerging markets were predicted by the World Bank to double their share of world's GDP um, by uh, 2010. 2020. They actually did it by 2010. And perhaps the most extraordinary example, um, and it's certainly, I think, been along with the collapse of Soviet communism, the most important political development and economic development in my lifetime, has been the rise of China. I first saw China in 1979 when I was a young member of parliament visiting Hong Kong and was taken up to the border at a place called Lo Wu um, and looked across at what was then the sleepy um, fishing village of Shenzhen and slow moving um, sail, sailboats um, on the river, duck ponds, uh, a few peasants cycling down the main street on those extraordinary great galumphing uh, Chinese bikes. Well, nowadays, as some of you will know, Shenzhen is a uh, great bustling capitalist, raw, um, Adam Smith out of Hieronymus Bosch. China is the second largest economy in the world, the largest exporter of um, uh, manufactured goods, exports even more sombreros than Mexico, the largest consumer of um, energy, the gee whiz statistics roll on and on, and quite a lot of people have made quite a bit of money writing books about them, which sell widely at the terminuses of international airports. Uh, to a considerable extent, what we're witnessing is simply the turn of history's wheel. Very large countries, provided people um, are seeing a rise in their uh, per capita income and wealth, um, very quickly, because of the aggregate consequences, have a bigger and bigger role on the international stage. Until 1820, China and India between them represented 50% of the world's um, output. Uh, that had declined, in China's case, it was 33% China, 16, 17% India. In China's case, that had fallen to just over 2% in 1980, when uh, Deng Xiaoping's reforms really uh, took off. And you see, you see some of the most dramatic consequences of what's happened by going back to that figure I mentioned earlier about America's share of global income. America's share of global income had fallen from the 38% that I mentioned to 30% by the end of the century. Between 2000 and 2010 it fell to 23%. In 2000 the Chinese economy was one-fifth the size of America's. <coughs> By 2011, it was over 40% the size of America's. China has grown at 
over 8% in all but eight of the last 35 years. And in the decade and a bit of this century has been responsible for half the total growth in the world economy. Now, that uh, raises in many people's um, imaginations what um, international relations experts, um, about which I have views, but I better not express them today. <laughs> What a lot of international relations experts, geopolitical experts, call the Thucydides trap. After um, the relationship between uh, Athens and Sparta, uh, and of course the Thucydides trap uh, is also thought, um, see all the books that are pouring off the printing presses about the outbreak of the First World War, the Thucydides trap is thought to have been uh, what triggered uh, the war between the rest of Europe, or much of the rest of Europe, and Germany in 1914. But I think much of the discussion about the relationship between China and the West, um, and in particular America today, slightly overdoes um, the advantages which China is said to have had. First of all, we, all of us, and particularly Americans, overdo American declinism. There's a rich, exotic tradition in America of doing quite a bit of it themselves. And Jeremiads about um, how awful things are getting because somebody's about to um, uh, overtake them. In fact, America's still the only country in the world which matters everywhere. It has global dominance of the commons, land, sea, air, space, uh, spending... Uh, as much on its military as the 10 next largest spenders put together. American manufacturing industry is reviving partly because America is becoming self-sufficient in energy. And it's better than anybody else at disruptive innovation. Look at the West Coast. Look at the large companies which have exploded onto the world market in the last few years. Innovation for two reasons. First of all, because America has 42 out of the 50 best universities in the world, um, a magnet for the best and the brightest, and because America, on the whole, has taken a pretty open view of immigration. Uh, this year in the United States, three quarters of all PhD papers on scientific subjects are being written by foreigners many of whom will stay in the United States and make their fortunes and America's in Silicon Valley. So uh, I'm not one of those who thinks that America's on its uppers, um, despite the fact that its politics <coughs> is dysfunctional. Um, footnote, um, I'm not sure that ours are much better, but I'll come to that. And despite the fact that in many respects, I think the Tea Party um, are more dangerous to the rest of us than um, many of the other things that we fret about uh, internationally. So what about China? Um, when China rules the world, um, the, the, name, the title of a book by the last editor um, of Marxism Today in the uh, United Kingdom, Martin Jakes, well... I'm not sure that we'll see that. Demographically, uh, China is moving from um, faster than anybody has before, from labor, su labor surplus to labor shortage. Um, it has an aging population. And um, by 2030, um, the number of retired in China will have increased threefold to 300 million. And by the 2040s, the largest population in the world will be Indian. Uh, India in the next uh, 20 years is adding uh, the equivalent of um, the working population of Europe. And by the middle of the 2040s, the largest country in the world will be India, and the second largest group of uh, people in the world will be Chinese pensioners. <laughs> Secondly, there are, which we can perhaps come back to in questions, 
uh, which, to be fair, Xi Jinping is trying to address at the moment. There are the four uns, as the last Chinese prime minister called them. Uh, the fact that, in his view, the Chinese economy was unsustainable. Um, for example, look at the pollution figures. Uncoordinated, for example, look at the difficulty of moving from investment in manufacturing to consumption. <laughs> Unstable, uh, look at the problems of social inequity and corruption. And unbalanced, uh, look at the family incomes in the east of the country and in the centre and the west. So big problems to deal with. And since I'm in France, um, let me also point out that there is an existential question as well. The debate that takes place in uh, Beijing is between those who say, unless, uh, it, it, unless the party um, gives up control over the economy, we won't create as many jobs and as much growth, and in those circumstances the party will lose control over the state. And on the other side there are those who say that if the party gives up control over the economy, it will certainly sooner or later lose control over the state. And I think China's great dilemma is that both sides of that argument are completely correct. Um, China's greatest service to the rest of the world will be to govern itself well in the next few years, to manage to handle those dilemmas, uh, and to avoid the sort of turbulence which would be in nobody's interest. would all be better served if China does well than if China does badly. But I don't think there is a Chinese model um, for how the globe should be, uh, should be managed. Um, China, I think, is focused principally on three things. First of all, keeping the Communist Party in power. Secondly, securing the uh, means of growth over the next few years. Uh, and uh, thirdly, ensuring its territorial integrity, even when that involves a few rocks um, in the East China Sea. So what of that briefly of ourselves, Britain and France, sharing membership of the European Union for different reasons historically? Uh, Britain, Monet said, uh, Britain's pro problem with the European Union was that we'd won the war. And there's some truth in that. We came to um, membership of the European Union late, after its main architecture had been laid down, and a number of the problems that we face today are a consequence of that. Uh, secondly, on your side, um, membership of the European Union, uh, not of course called that initially, was the institutional consequence of that act of reconciliation with Germany uh, exemplified in that photograph, that iconic photograph of President Mitterrand and Chancellor Kohl at the Ossuary in Verdun. That reconciliation, which one has never seen in Asia between Japan and uh, China, extraordinary um, uh, historical um, uh, reconciliation. But it's worked in some curious ways. Let me say what I mean. Uh, when we were faced with the prospect of German unification, Margaret Thatcher used to argue against it on the grounds that she liked Germany so much she wanted two of them. <laughs> and initially, initially, um, she thought that uh, President Mitterrand went along with that view. President Mitterrand was actually playing a, a more when we said cunning, a more um, uh, <laughs> realpolitik hand, um, ambivalent as ever. <laughs> President Mitterrand uh, made it clear, and this has been um, seen in papers uh, leaked from the German Foreign Office, President Mitterrand made it clear that he was prepared to support German unification provided Germany dumped the Deutschmark and accepted a European currency. If he'd known that that was going to 
further strengthen Germany's dominance in the European Union. I wonder if he would have been quite so keen on a project whose purposes were primarily political rather than uh, economic. I think that in Britain and France and in the rest of Europe, we face, and I'll be very brief about this, in order to avoid the Chicago <laughs> I think we face three real problems. First of all, um, there is a relationship between demography and competitiveness, which goes right back to what I was saying earlier about uh, China and competition from emerging markets. In a sense, the demographic issue is one that in both Britain and France we avoid. Your fertility rate is 2.3, ours is 1.9. Our populations will continue to increase. Overall, Europe's population will fall by at least 20% by the middle of the century. Portugal's and Poland's fertility rate is 1.3. A fertility rate which would mean halving your population every 45 years. In the 19th century, our dominance was partly because of demographic factors. Our share of the world's population went up from a fifth to a quarter. Now in this century, we're seeing our population fall, and unless we do something pretty dramatic about our underlying growth rate, it is inevitable that our share of world trade and world output will fall as well. And that is where we stumble into uh, Angela Merkel's Iron tri Triangle. 7% of the world's population and falling, 25% of the world's output and falling, 50% of the world's spending on social policies. Discuss. <laughs> Secondly, um, it's <clears throat> impolite of an outsider, particularly perhaps a Brit, to discuss some of the sharper points in the debate about <coughs> the future of the uh, Euro. The only point I would like to make is there does seem to me to be an issue about the role of political legitimacy, accountability in national parliaments, which we sort of duck. When Confucius was asked by one of his followers, what would be the first thing you would do if you were a ruler? He said, um, I would rectify the names. And his disciple said to him, are you kidding me? Are you making a joke? And he said, no. If things don't mean what you tell us they mean, then social life disintegrates. It's impossible for to make things work, either institutionally or in other ways. So will there, become a po will there come a point when we face up to issues of accountability and parliamentary accountability, when we talk about um, fiscal integration and uh, uh, transfers within the European Union or those members who have signed up to the to Economic and Monetary Union. It's, it's in all our interest that the Euro should work. But there do seem to me to be some fairly profound issues that we have to resolve about accountability uh, in a union where there isn't a European demos, where what applies in the United States applies even more strongly in Europe. Let me explain. Harry Truman had on his desk a sign which said on one side, you'll recall, the buck stops here. On the other side it said, I'm from Missouri. <laughs> Monsieur Hollande is from France. Angela Merkel is from Germany. David Cameron, you may have noticed, is from Britain. They may all recognise, as I do, that we share um, uh, some European identity we're principally 
British or French or Italian or Polish or Portuguese. And while that doesn't entirely encompass all our political instincts, when it comes to trying to make things accountable in democracies, it's national parliaments um, which have the greatest legitimacy and the greatest credibility. The, th the third thing I just want to mention briefly is um, our role um, in the world. I think there is a huge gap, despite the um, wonderfully successful efforts last week and in previous weeks of Lady Ashton over Iran and before that Kosovo, there's a huge gap between Europe's pretensions on the global stage and what we actually achieve. And I think that's uh, particularly perhaps disturbing for um, this country and for, the, uh, and for my own, for the United Kingdom. Over the last years, common foreign and security policy um, has seemed to me more and more um, similar to what philosophers call a category error. And unless we actually make um, Europe's presence felt in those areas where we have real responsibilities around our borders to continue to stabilize our continent, unless we actually use those things we have agreed to share, where there's European competence, unless we um, uh, ensure that uh, we manage those properly, for example trade, uh, we're going to continue to punch below our weight. So, not to end too gloomily, but it does seem to me that we're poised in Europe between two of my favourite uh, remarks. The first is the what Herb Stein, the American economist, used to call the first law of economics. Things that can't go on forever don't. The second is a line from what I think is the best, the greatest uh, political novel uh, in Europe, um, The Leopard by Lampedusa, uh, in which I think it's Prince Tancredi, and I don't have this quote entirely correct, but it's more or less this. Things that can't go on forever, sorry, um, uh, things have to change in, in order to remain the same. So somewhere between Stein uh, and uh, Lampedusa, I think Europe has to uh, shape its destiny. And I think that will only be done if political leaders are much more honest about what we can achieve on our own, what we can achieve working together, and what we have to do both alone and working together if we're to avoid a future in which those emerging markets um, eat our breakfast, lunch and dinner as well. Suitable gastronomic note on which to finish in Paris. Thank you very much.